Please like and subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon to get new video updates. Welcome to the Moth Podcast. I'm your host for this week, Kate Tellers. Life is all about compromises, and some are easier reached than others. So this week, our stories are about striking a deal, bartering, negotiating, shaking hands, all of it. Up first is Denise Bledsoe's Slaughter. Denise told this at a DC Story Slam, where the theme of the night was beg, borrow, steal. Here's Denise live at the Moth. Okay, first of all, I want to say that I'm gonna strangle my friend, JR, who talked me into doing this. Okay. So you all support murder. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am 66 years old. And this brief story is about uh, my time in grad school in Providence, Rhode Island. I went to grad school at Brown University. I work very proudly now at UDC, that's the University of the District of Columbia. And I thought that on today, I have a story that reflects both borrowing uh, and begging. And uh, in the spirit of Martin Luther King and why can't we all just get along, this is a brief story about Pearl Wolf, one of my two Jewish mothers. Everybody should have a black mother and a Jewish mother. Okay, I have been privileged to have had both. And Pearl was my Jewish mother at Brown for six years. And my last year of grad school, I had custody of my younger brother who I might note, I still have custody of <laughs> 45 years later. You do the math. <laughs> it's gotten worse with age. Uh, but really, I, he was in the ninth grade. I took custody of him. My brother's gay. And uh, he and his father, my stepfather, were not getting along. I told my mother, I'll take him to school with me for a couple of weeks. It turned into the whole year. And Providence weather is not that bad, but it can get cold in the winter. Uh, and it did. It changed the trajectory of my life in many ways. And one of those was that I had to work. Uh, and uh, the money that I made was not enough for that first oil delivery. So we were cold. And I called family members around the country. We were, we were not poverty stricken, but it wasn't a whole lot of extra money. I called my older sister. Oh, wow, I wish you had called me a couple of weeks ago. I just got back from Nassau. And, uh, you know, I don't have any money to spare. I called my mother's famous sister, Velma, <laughs> whose no, husband's name was Jacques, actually it was Jack, when, <laughs> when I first met him. And as soon as I mentioned money, she says, oh, you need to speak to Jacques. <laughs> Jacques, of course, says, uh, we don't have any money, and I knew it was a lie. I needed $180, which today is, it doesn't sound like a lot, but uh, what's this, 1976? That was a lot of money. So I'm whining to Pearl, with whom I work. And Pearl, you've got to imagine, is this short, squat woman. You know, she looked like she was a bodybuilder in her youth or something. And she had a cigarette permanently glued to the inside <laughs> of her lip, and she could talk with it like Susan Hayward in the movies. And so she says, what do you need? I said, $180. She said, come by the house tonight. I'll give it to you. I said, Pearl, I don't know when I'll be able to pay it back. And she said, that's OK. That's OK. And so she loaned me that money. And it got us through the winter. And the point of my story is that at the end of that year, 
I told her I would pay her back. I still didn't have $180. She said, you got a little refrigerator, right? And I said, yeah, I do, as a matter of fact. What are you going to do with it? And this is the end of my grad school years. I said, I don't know. I, I said, you want it? She had three children lined up to go to Brown. <laughs> so she said, I'll take the refrigerator. So that was my introduction to bartering. And I paid off my debt to Pearl uh, in any number of ways. And just as a footnote to my story, uh, my brother, who went on to become a soldier, uh, so thank you for your service. I thank him for his. He also was diagnosed with HIV in 1983, and he's still alive. He survived all these years. Oh, no. No, that would be too simple. <laughs> he became a crack addict and an alcoholic, and that is what you should be applauding. He survived that. He finished his undergraduate years and just got his master's in rehab counseling. So I thank Pearl Wolf for keeping us warm. That was Denise Bledsoe Slaughter. Denise was raised in Washington, D.C. and is a proud graduate of McKinley Tech High School and Brown University. She has a son and daughter-in-law who also live in the city. In an email to our podcast team, Denise wrote, take care and keep smiling. You'll live longer and happier. To see some photos of Denise and her brother, head to the extras for this episode on our website, themoth.org slash extras. Up next, Bill Robinson. Something to note about Bill's story. At The Moth, we are sensitive to when storytellers do accents from places and cultures they're not a part of. However, Bill's version of a Brooklyn accent didn't feel like punching down or making fun, so this team of Moth New Yorkers gave it the thumbs up. Bill told this at a story slam in Chicago where the theme of the night was business. Here's Bill live at The Moth. So for the first six years out of college, I worked as a youth minister right up the road in Winnetka. And then I got married, we wanted to start a family, and I thought, okay, I'm gonna have to get something that makes a little bit more money. So I took the next logical step, and say it with me, became the sales manager for a plumbing and heating valve company. <laughs> So I'd been in that job about a year, and I'm on my first business trip without my boss. And because I was in New York City, I was calling on our largest customer. And he was located in Brooklyn. And this was in the early 90s, so long before Brooklyn became the artisan, handcrafted, trendy place that it is today. And I walked through this door of this big warehouse, and it was just chaos. Contractors everywhere, just a mass of people all pushing their way up to the counter. And I'm in my suit and a polite Midwestern guy, so I sort of kind of wait my turn. And the guy right in front of me is yelling at the guy behind the counter saying, you're not gonna spot me credit for one lousy pump? I spend hundreds of dollars in here every day, and you're not gonna spot me credit for one lousy pump? And the guy behind the counter introduces me to New York customer service, which was, he responded with, okay, I'll explain it one more time. You give me money, I give you shit. You don't give me money, I don't give you shit. Now get the fuck out of here. <laughs> So, so this guy pushes past me, I go up and I say, I'm, I'm here to see Warren, and he says, does he know you? And I said, yes, I, I have an appointment, and he looks over his shoulder and he says, Tony, this guy says he knows Warren. And Tony helpfully says, and I, I can't figure out what I'm supposed to do because there's no way to get, the only way to get over the counter is to either crawl over it or crawl under. So I go down, I crawl under, <laughs> he, he walks me through a doorway and then this massive room with you know, dozens of desks and there's one in the middle and he points to the one in the middle and I go stand there and there's this huge guy behind the desk, not fat, but just big, and he's talking on the phone, eating a sandwich, and typing on his computer all at the same time. So I stand there for about 10 minutes without him acknowledging me. He finally puts down the phone and says, what do you want? And I explain that I'm here, thank him for his business, we have the valves, we can ship them to him, here's the price. He says, oh, no, 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 my friend. 
and he writes something down on a piece of paper and tosses it on his desk to me, and I, I said, what's this? And he said, I can buy those valves from your competitor for that price. And I said, well, then you should do that because that's a really good price and those are good valves. <laughs> Which was not what he was expecting to hear, and that sort of angered him. <laughs> so I'm, I'm explaining to him my rationale, and he keeps scratching his chest, and after the third time, I realized it probably wasn't a rash. He wanted to make sure I noticed the gun that was in the shoulder <laughs> holster uh, uh, under his coat. So I realized very quickly, he's not gonna buy anything from me that day. So I said, you know where to find me. You can call me if you change your mind. And I put my hand out to shake his hand and he starts to stand up and I think, oh, this is sort of a sign of respect. I was very proud of myself until I realized that he, had, he wasn't standing up. What he was doing was he grabbed my hand and then he pulled me so that I fell flat on top of his desk with my legs sticking out behind me. <laughs> And our noses are this far from one another, and he looks me in the eye, squeezes my hand like a vice, and says, now why do you wanna fuck with me? I'm gonna tell you what's gonna happen now. You're gonna step out the door, and you're gonna say, I fucked up. I should've done business with Warren, but I wouldn't do business with Warren. And then you're gonna get on that plane, and you're gonna look down over this fine city, and you're gonna say, oh, I fucked up. I should have done business with Warren, and I wouldn't do business with Warren. And then you're gonna have to walk into work, and Jim's gonna say, hey, Bill, did you get the order? And you're gonna have to say, no, Jim, I fucked up. I wouldn't do business with Warren. <laughs> and I couldn't think anything to do but to squeeze with what was left of my hand and, and say, I do wanna do business with you, I just can't do it at that price. So I come back to Chicago. A few days later, the phone rings. It's Warren. <laughs> Still got those valves? Yeah. What's the price? The same price it was before. Okay, um, would you throw in some humidifiers for my uncles? <laughs> I, we had these humidifiers for like $50. I said, uh, sure, yeah, I got three uncles and they need humidifiers, you'll put those in for free? N yeah, okay, then I'll take 80 gross of the valves. Great, well, that was a big order for us. So I'm writing up the order and he says, you know what, Bill, you're pretty good at this. What'd you used to do before you start working for the valve company? Uh, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. No, seriously, what'd you used to do? I, I was a youth minister to church. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> no, no, no that, that's, that's what I used to do. And uh, he says, well, you know what? You're actually pretty good at this. Next time you come to New York, I'm buying you some bagels and I'm gonna make you an honorary fucking New Yorker. <laughs> and from that point, he did that the next time he came to New York and from that point on, doing business with Warren was easy. <laughs> Thank you. That was Bill Robinson. Bill works for the American Dental Association and is currently leading a startup company on their behalf called ADA Practice Transitions. He credits storytelling as critical to his success in business and, in particular, for raising the funding for the company he now runs. Bill, as the director of MothWorks at The Moth, you are speaking my language. He lives with his wife, Laura, in Arlington Heights, Illinois, where they are grateful empty nesters. Bill wanted listeners to know that even though he and Warren played hardball before reaching a deal, they were arguing about a difference of only seven cents per valve. That's all for this week. Until next time, from all of us here at The Moth, have a story-worthy week. Kate Tellers is a storyteller, host, and director of MothWorks at The Moth. Her story, but also bring cheese, is featured in The Moth's All These Wonders, true stories about facing the unknown. Her writing has appeared on McSweeney's and in The New Yorker. This episode of The Moth Podcast was produced by me, Julia Purcell, with Sarah Austin Janess and Sarah Jean Johnson. The rest of The Moth's leadership team includes Catherine Burns, Sarah Haberman, Jennifer Hickson, Meg Bowles, Kate Tellers, Jennifer Birmingham, Marina Cluche, Suzanne Rust, Brandon Grant, Inga Gladowski, and Aldi Kaza. Moth stories are true as remembered and affirmed by storytellers. For more about our podcast, information on pitching your own story, and everything else, go to our website, themoth.org. The Moth Podcast is presented by PRX, the Public Radio Exchange, helping make public radio more public at prx.org.